Alrighty, folks, welcome along to another episode of the Made to Pray podcast. You're joining us on a great episode here on our brand new season, season number six. I hope you've been enjoying all the episodes that we, we've put out for you so far. Um, there's been some great stories there, some great insights into the, the bond scene um, right across Northern Ireland and Scotland as well. And we're joined tonight by another Scottish bond. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Pat Logan from the Sarsen or lovingly known as the Sorry. I'm just going to bring him in now, and we'll get ourselves um, started on the podcast. So, Pat, absolutely delighted that you're on on the on the, the podcast, and uh, obviously, you know, in terms of bonds that I have a lot of admiration for, the, the Sorry is definitely one of them, and I have a number of, obviously, CDs from the bond and stuff here, and uh, any time you are over, here in Belfast, you know, it's always trying to keep an eye out for you and, and get a wee listen in, see if there's anything I can steal from you, you know. Yeah. And uh, yes, yes, <laughs> but uh, maybe it'd be a good place for us to start, like we always do on the podcast. Maybe give us a wee bit of an insight into how you got involved in a, in a bond in the first instance and what kind of sparked your interest. Yeah, I think it's more kind of family ties. My whole family have always been involved involved in the. We all enjoyed that. Um, you know, even when I was a wee boy in the mid seventies, I used to always be, be walking with the orange and carrying the cord and looking uh-huh. through the rail and junior ranks, etc. Um, and I always said a wee bit a family tie. We one of my cousins was always in the band, and I right, remember okay. going for every single parade. I would walk next to the drum section, always in that same that same position, and right. follow that as a wee boy for for a long, long time. So I was never I never allowed to join. At that stage, um, right. until I think 11, I think 10 or 11 by the time I actually I was allowed to join the band. But my whole family's okay. on my mum, my dad, my, my brothers and sisters came through the junior and juvenile and junior ranks, and um, uh-huh. the best one after that. Um, but no, it was always it was always this area. I remember following the guys as a, a wee boy for every single parade I could, I would be there following them. Okay, so we, you, you, you're, a, you're a one bomb man, then is that right? Or? I'm a one band man. I broke I broke away for the band oh, probably early eighties for, for under half a year to go and join the Mountain Star. Right. Um, the, the band the Sari wouldn't let me play a drum because I was too small. So I decided to right. I went to the Mountain Star for for about half right. a year. And I remember walking into Thornley Bank in the snow one day with the uh-huh. Mountain Star with my cravat on and I, I took a bit of slagging for that, to be honest right. with you. <laughs> I took a bit of slagging, but it was under a year, and the boys are always reminding me that I've got that broken service. So, right, okay, <laughs> brilliant. So, obviously, you were saying you were involved in the orange, and uh, the orange, the, the, the lodge that you were involved in, were you, they were connected to the bond, were they? They were, they were part of the, the district in Springburn. It was a juvenile lodge, um, LOL eighty nine in Springburn in Glasgow here. And then I kind of progressed on to Junior 20 in Springburn as well. That lodge is kind of no longer here. But um, we were up in that lodge until we were maybe about 14, 15, I think. Right. Uh, I remember one year there was probably five or sixes at the band in the lodge at that time, young boys all together. Um, and it was at that time they were trying to get members, you know, out in the street and things. And they were trying to kind of get us out there instead of walking with the band on parades and uh-huh. things. That, uh, that kind of drove us away from it. Um, right. Never actually had none of us that was involved with the band at that time. We've actually went back into the Orange Lodge. Um, right. We were always first and foremost, foremost we were kind of bandsmen. Um, sure. We were all pals together. But I remember that because I remember it was a junior rally over here and they were trying to get everybody to go and parade with the juniors. But obviously, uh-huh. we, were, we were bandsmen and, and wanted to kind of tie in with the band at that time. Sure. Just as we kind of say, no, you know, what do you think you got, you got out of being in the Junior Orange? Was it just purely because you wanted to be out on the parade and you, you you weren't being allowed to join a bond until you were older? Or was there something else involved in terms of the whole process of being on, in the Junior Orange? I think it was just a natural progression um, right. for, for, the, for the initial Juvenile Lodge into the Junior Lodge. When I was in the Juvenile Lodge, I was the, the worthy master for a number of years in there and there was always things like Bible reading competitions and, and that type of thing taking place. And I think moving into the, the junior lodge at that time was just an actual progression. Once you got to a certain age, I can't remember uh-huh. something told me it was 12 or something, around about that. Right, you okay. Into, you into the junior lodge. Um, so it was just a bit of an actual progression. But first and foremost, once I, I kind of joined the band, I was always a bandsman. 
uh, the band was my main interest, definitely. So sure. when it came to that stage, it was only really one decision for me and the rest of the boys at that point in time. Uh-huh. Cool. So talk me through that whole thing of going down, joining the band, you know, maybe heading down the, the hall or wherever you practiced for the first time. What was that kind of like? Never acting. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> and they, and <laughs> days, I mean, the, the, the Sari in their days would have had 60, 70 members. Uh, right, okay. Band, um, an established band at that point in time. Uh -huh. We used to practice in a wee school, Hyde Park School, which is only 200 yards or so for the band hall now. Um, right. And just across the street. But uh, it was nerve wracking to say the least. Um, but in the days when we didn't join the band, there was a couple of old, older members, old Charlie Hayes and then uh -huh. the mother, they were all well known in the band scene. Um, and they used to, they were the two guys that would teach the young boys. Uh, right. And we were taught to play a penny whistle. Uh, and we were still getting taught music at that stage. Right, okay. Uh, but young Stuart was another Hayes, and he'd taken over, and he was starting to introduce in the 80s kind of simple system, just A, B, C, D, and things like that. Uh -huh. So there was a wee bit of a, a kind of conflict, if you like, in the band, where the older guys wanted to keep the music. Uh -huh. um, Stuart just wanted to progress the way a lot of other Blood and Thunder bands were doing at that time. But see, the right. Saracen Wesley, the Saracen were a prize slip band back in the day. Right. Um, Hello, bass drums and things lying about that still say Saracen Truth Defenders prize flute band. And a lot of the okay. older bands they still call us that. Um, right. So we kind of went full circle and kind uh -huh. of went back to, you know, back to playing parts. But for a long period through the mid 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was just kind of quite a strict just B and T band. Right, okay. Um, band for what it is at the minute. I remember yeah. working with the band with probably 46 flutes and 16 drums, I think. Um, right, okay. We were on a train that day in Springburn train station on the platform, we went to Alexander Parade, uh, uh -huh. and that was the size of the band that we had then. Um, right, wow. unruly, maybe a bit unruly, I would say. <laughs> kind of, <laughs> what hard to, to get rid, lose that kind of reputation, which kind of followed the band through that, through that period. Uh -huh. um, and it's it's difficult when you've got that amount of that amount of members, that amount of different characters in the band. It yeah. can go it can go kind of quite a few different ways to be honest with you. But we were only young guys at that time. Uh -huh. coming up through it. But sure, I think sure. the first time joining the band was nerve wracking. Um, yeah. Just it must have been it must have been a bit out of um bit out of character for the scene to have a bond that says at that time. What a um, I don't know. There was still there was a lot lots of big bands and still back then, you know, like the government production boys but they had a big band then. Um but we, we were always kind of quite a big band there. I'm, I mean I'm uh -huh. going back to the eighties, um to the start of the eighties and it didn't it didn't last that long. Right. It started to kind of drop in numbers and, and get down a wee bit, but it was kind of kind of fashionable, I would say, at that point in time. Right, okay. Right. Young guys in Springburn, I mean we're if an area in Glasgow, North Glasgow, North East Glasgow called uh -huh. Springburn, which is no, um, you know, it's a wee bit kind of socially deprived and it doesn't get a very good write up for right. anybody. Right. So it was the, the band was fashionable at that time, really fashionable. Uh, and in the area, there was, I mean, Springburn's totally changed. They, they put our Joe Carries way through the middle of it and ripped the heart out of it. Um, but right. even yeah. where we're still in the heart of Springburn with the band hall, but around the corner of us, there used to be two or three pubs, which were all good, you know, good Rangers pubs, as you would call them. Right. Um, in Springburn as well, you had Celtic clubs, you had all sorts. So there was a, mm -hmm. there was a, there was a bit of a mix. So I think the early eighties, the bands were really fashionable because there wasn't really a lot else to do about here. Yeah, um, I think there was. But I always remember us having big, big numbers back then. Definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, in terms of your learning process, then obviously you know you mentioned a couple of people who were responsible for for teaching people. What do you remember oh, about your oh, first attempts to to play the flute and how you were instructed? <laughs> just, I mean, it, it's a bit frustrating, isn't it? Really, <laughs> four months where you're, you're, you're kind of trying to get a note out of it and trying to get something. But I remember, and, and I keep saying that the young, the young kids that we've got here, they've still got quite healthy numbers in, in my learner class. But uh -huh. they need to keep practicing. They need to keep at it and don't get demoralised and just keep going. But I remember back then, 1981, something like that. You would have been constantly on your foot, absolutely mm -hmm. constantly on your flute and playing your flute and you would hear somebody in the next close blowing the foot flute and playing the flute. Um, yeah. So you would just yeah. it constantly. But I, I would say a bit frustrating, but with, with fantastic teachers. I mean, old old Charlie Hayes, even back then in the, the band scene, um, and Eddie Miller, two guys locally, but the, the, 
the band was always family orientated at that time right. as well, looked after by the Hazies and Castles and the, the Gibsons, all John Gibson and things, who were all founder members of the band, but they're all still active at that point in time. Sure. Um, but they're, they're, sadly, there's there's no many of them left now, to be honest. Most of them are sadly passed away. Uh, it's the nature of the the beast of isn't it? In terms of you know, the longer the bar goes, the the, the further you get away from the, those those early roots and stuff and anything, you know. Um, unless there's a, a continuing family legacy throughout that, which some bonds do seem to do seem to have. So it took you a wee while getting your head around and your your lips around the flute and getting notes and stuff going on. What were your your first kind of tunes that you picked up? <laughs> I remember the first tune I learned to play was well, apart from God Save the Queen. The next tune was Wise Men, the old Elvis song. Right. Uh, the band used to play that. And I remember that being the first tune we played, the very first time I played with the band. Mm -hmm. uh, and the old trolls in Millibanks across the road. You used to have flip bands in on a Saturday before the football. Um, and I, I think I was only in the band maybe two or three months. And I got a big jumper that was about two sizes too big for me and a bow tie <laughs> that size. And I got thrown in the front rank. And that was the very first tune, Wise Men. Tunes like that, and I remember playing like Seven Tears. Uh -huh. and all, they, all they kind of daft ditty tunes. I remember playing all them and getting taught all that type of stuff. Um, right. But that, that's kind of quite vivid, that. And we still talk about these things to, to these days, some of the tunes it was about then. Uh -huh. And then, how, how many tunes would you have had to carry then to get out? Because obviously, you were, you were, were you thrown out on one, or were, did you have to learn a few more before you? We were, I think you'd have been lucky, you'd have been thrown in if you knew five tunes in the days. Uh, you know, I think that's the way it was. It was a lot, of it was about numbers and about impact on the size of the band and things in the days. But I think you'd be lucky if I knew five or six tunes at that point in time. I mean, I was only 11 years old, 12 years old, something like that. Yeah, um, just a wee guy. We still got photos in the, the band till here for the days as well. And uh -huh. uh, I, they're, they're good memories, but it, it wasn't like, no, like now the boys have got to be to a a kind of decent level and know a real high percentage of the tunes before uh, what we'll kind of spend that money kitting them out and, and kind mm. of move you know into the rank sort of thing so yeah um, we're aware of that but back then it was i was completely different totally i i because the band new to what it is new to then is unrecognizable yeah I can imagine. yeah and we'll get into that i suppose as, as we head along there but because I think one of the things is there's an element of cost and stuff because obviously uniforms today are quite different to what you would have been. You're saying, no, like here's a jumper that's three sizes too big, you know, in terms of what bonds were wearing and what they do today. It kind of, it's a completely different story altogether. And that has an impact on while you buy uniforms for people and stuff straight off rather yeah. than kind of think of. But I know I always talk about whenever, like for me, whenever I joined, I joined uh, the, the Prairie Raven in 19... 80, 82 uh -huh. it on, um, but we had a we had a hundred percent tunes we couldn't walk yeah. unless we had a hundred percent of the of the tunes down and the, the guy that taught me how to play the flute terry he had a list and you had to get all the tunes marked off the list and uh but not just that there you had to play them in front of the band yeah. you know so you had to like be not just Play in front of Terry, but everybody else had to hear you um, without a mistake. And he wouldn't, if you made one mistake or two mistakes in the tune, he wouldn't even mark it off for you. He was like, kind of going, No, you don't know it. Um, uh, go back, come back next week. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was totally different to that you know, here at that time. Uh -huh. uh, definitely in, in our type of band or style of band. And many of the bands at that, that time here in Glasgow, they were, I mean, they're probably non existent, to be honest, for a period. Mm. Um, until it started to pick up again mid to late 80s. Um, sure. But no, it was, it was kind of non existent at that point in time. Everybody in, in our band in particular, you know, it was about the, the size of bands you could get out the street the day of the big walk, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, just for numbers and things. And uh, I mean, I remember walking back into Springburn in the days and it would have been black. The crowds would have been 10 deep on yeah. the pavement all the way up the old Springburn Road and different things. Um, and even back in the days as well, we've got a, a close affiliation with the Valley Craigie. Right. Um, and they're, act they're actually coming back out here for to Springburn this year. A private oh, right. one number 49, I think. Um, so they're coming out for a last one, so I think so. Right. That be as well. That would be interesting. I remember days like that when, you know, the, the, the band, the, the size that we were, the, the Sari was in their days, and then the size of the Craigie. Mm. Uh, we did, they all used to walk one way with the Craigie, and he'd walk back with the Sari and things like that. Right. So, okay. With the right kind of close affiliation with the boys as well back in that day. 
Because right, they've went through some changes as well, haven't they? Bally Craig over the years, you know, and then obviously the, the old boys bond, which is kind of a, a wee bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? Because it's uh, everybody of every age is in the old boys bond with Bally Craig and I, like, aren't they? <laughs> I don't even know if they, the, 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 I think it's just the old boys that's that good now, is it no? Yeah, it is. It's just it's just the old boys. Every everybody, I think you know, it was one of them things where I think the, everybody was. I don't want to talk about the tournament, but I'd say maybe people were having more fun with the old boys. Yeah. And uh, you know, once you ding around the front, you know, it's it's like it's, it's game over, like you know. So, um, no, but, but no. Get back then. It used to be, we would, you know, we would go and pick the guys up. My dad used to be the district secretary, and we would take the bus down as I was a wee boy, and we'd go and pick the Craigie up at the boat and bring them back up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they would all go and stay with everybody. So we used to always have, you know, two or three boys from Bally Craigie uh, staying in the house and things. And a lot of them, the rest of them would be staying in the street with their neighbours and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So that went on for a good few years. Um, so there's always been a close affiliation with the band and the, the kind of district here in Springburn. Um, sure. Are the, the you aware of where that came from, Pat? You know, how, what, what, how, what led to that relationship with the Bally Craigie development? I don't know. Obviously, they, when they came to Springburn, uh, a private laws brought them, and I couldn't even tell you who that was at the time uh, within the district. But it just became, you know, a kind of friendship between the, the two uh-huh. bands at that time, which we still keep to this day. We we still go into Antrim every 13th and we spend a day in the knee breakers and have a, a kind of harmony and things in there. And we still see a lot of the old boys for the Craigie uh, when we visit that. So I, I don't know what, what started that originally. I, would have, I was only a wee boy at that time, but... Mm-hmm. I just remember it lasting for a, a good period. I remember it first when it first started. I was still carrying a cord for the right. banner. The boy used to carry a cord, and everybody would give you, you know, two bob or something to stick in your tail. Right. Um, so it was a way back a long, long time ago. But it's amazing the way that happens, though, isn't it? Because a lot of the bonds here in Belfast have a close affiliation with a particular bond in in Scotland. You know, I mean, I, I can think of a number of bonds over the years you know the, they've developed you know these long-term relationships you know yeah. i think of the likes of leg and valley and pride of the mail being a big yeah. thing you know back in the day and stuff and then obviously or, or the raven and motherwell and stuff you know i like the, the, the pride of motherwell would, would have been a bond that there would have been a, a link with and then other bonds as well have got these ongoing connections with the uh, with, with scottish bonds and it, it, i know they talk about hands across the sea and all that kind of thing but Within the bond scene, that's a real that's a real thing, isn't it? It is a real thing, aye, and it, and it does stand the test of time, without a doubt. Uh, I mean, I can, as I say, I can still go, and some of the boys for the Craigie will come over here this year, and we'll, you know, you'll still know them, you'll still remember mm-hmm. them, and, and different things. So it does, it stands the test of time. Um, but we used to go to Antrim and parade in Antrim as well with the boys for the steeple. So again, mm-hmm. there's another band for Antrim town as well there, so we had a wee bit of affiliation with that town. As well, but close links for there, you know, they, they stood the test of time without a doubt, and they still exist today, definitely. Yeah, well, and it's great, and, and I think it, it, it's you know that some of those bonds have deepened a lot. You know, a lot of bonds. And I remember when I was the I was with the Bal McCart the fan. I would ever been in two bonds. I was in the the Raven to start off, and then went to the Bal McCart the yeah. and then back to the Raven and stuff. And, and it, but the Bal McCart had a, a, a long standing connection with the Black School for a long period of time as well. You know, there was a a real kind of deep connection between those guys and uh and th- those two bonds love being together you know you know i i wasn't around for some of it but you know you hear some of the stories in regards to you know the the exchange trips over you know the yeah. when the ball card um, at the, one of the black schools competitions cleaning up you know as a melody bond even taking home the blood and thunder prize at the end stuff you know yeah. so you know you can imagine what kind of day that was but yeah. it's uh there's a great affiliation, and I think the Black Skull re- more recently would have had a big connection with uh, William King in London there, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. whenever they were over to him, the priest there and stuff. Now, I love that connection, and Scotland's all was is a big part of most people's stories here as well, you know. So I'm, it sounds like it's potentially the same on the other side there as well, because whenever I'm talking to people about Stanley memories from Bonds here, it's first trip to Scotland. Or trips to Scotland always come up as uh, these are key moments for us. And then I was talking with, with Phil Brown there the other day from the Netherton, yeah. and he was talking about how Belfast Twelve, Belfast Twelve, you know. So it, it seems it seems to work. Yeah, the, the Belfast Twelve has always been the, the kind of parade that finishes your year. Right, um, and it's always the big it's always the big parade on the calendar. I mean, for mm-hmm. a, for a number of years we did the day Belfast. We were in Antrim. We walked in Carrick Fergus district for a number of years. Sure. They ended up back in um, Belfast, Walton, Ballinafy district. Um, uh-huh. 
a few years and then a couple of years back we walked in East Belfast. Um, but the 12th of July for us, the trip to the 12th has always been the, you know, the, the finale, if you like, of the year. And years mm -hmm. ago when the band scene, uh, the, the band scene was kind of seasonal, if you like, when it ran mm -hmm. for that couple of months. That was, I mean, that was the build up. We were building up to the 12th of, the, the 12th of July. And I used to say to the boys, yeah. if you're not in the band to go to the 12th of July, then you're knowing it for the right reasons, you know, because that should be where you're aiming for every year. Mm -hmm. You get there and make sure you're going there for the celebration. So, yeah. um, no, but that, that was always the, the, the trips. I mean, we've got trips over there are legendary for us, you know, and uh -huh. the boys talk about them every time we're having a wee social in here, that the stories still pop up and everything, you know, so uh -huh. it's definitely it, it kind of culminates in, in, in the 12th of the year for us, without a doubt. Yeah, I know, and, and it's, it's it's what you're mentioning there, you know, how the, the, the parading season used to be seasonal, because for me, I remember it always used to be, for me, it was, it was Easter Monday to the yeah. last Saturday in August. That was kind of you know, the range of the, yeah. and depending on how early Easter was, you know, you were kind of always praying for an early Easter, you know, yeah. so you could get out quick. Yeah. Um, but then you knew bonds were trying to, you know, put as many things together in between that period as well, because most people didn't seem to want to do anything yeah. prior to Easter. But now that the bond scene, it seems to be all year round. There doesn't seem to be too many. We've, we've been out, we've done two parades already, one that Saturday there and one the Saturday before. So, Mm -hmm. It started for us already, but it's getting it's kind of getting more and more difficult. Uh, especially that there's not as many culture days and things happening now. So again, that was other things that you were at it quite yeah. a lot. But definitely, it was turning into a twelve month um, gig, you yeah. know, in terms of being in the band. Um, but, but as you say, initially when you had that three four months top something like that, that's that's what the band scene used to always be, and you couldn't wait yeah. to get back there to the first parade again every year. That's it, exactly. If you were out any time in September, October time, you're like kind of going, whoa, this is a novelty. You know, yeah. we're not just, it's just standard. You know, you can expect it to be a few times, you know, but, uh, but, uh, but, and I suppose that, that brings its own pressures in the bond scene. I suppose we'll head on that a wee bit later as well, because we're all affected by that, you know, and because obviously life has changed so much since, since those days, you know. So roll us back a wee bit. You, you already mentioned a wee bit about your first period. Pat, you know, and what that was like. What, what, what are your recollections of walking with the bomb for the first time? Just being <laughs> the recollection was walking in the front rank as a wee boy and trying to avoid the base of sticks. <laughs> right. <laughs> I always remember that. Um, <laughs> but no, the, just just the sheer size and scale of the crowds, the size and scale of the band, um, just and just it was just sheer enjoyment. To be honest with you, just as a young boy being part of that. Mm -hmm. And I always, you know, I, I kind of craved it, I suppose, as a young kid. For years yeah. before like, my mum and dad would allow me to join, I kind of craved it for years. Uh, and when I got there, eventually, it was everything that I expected and more, looking back on it, definitely. But, um, no, it was. I think it was a big walk. I think it was the, the main Glasgow big walk, as we call it here. I think uh -huh. that was a parade with the band. Yeah. Um, and with jumpers, big woolly jumpers, and a, a black dicky bow and a white shirt. As I say, mm -hmm. probably about three sizes too big. And if it rained, then it, it got about six sizes too big. And right. they, absolutely, <laughs> they absolutely stank. I always remember that. If the jumpers <laughs> getting broken. So I think that's probably the first couple of years with the jumpers and then we managed to progress to the white shirts. Um, right, okay. The game, which a lot of people still remember the band. Um, right. the white shirts. But the story behind right. the white shirts is they were, they were actually supposed to be burgundy. Um, right. Because back, back in the days, the band was known as the, the Maroon Army. Right, back okay. In the, in the early 80s, just with the numbers and things. So we were all, we all turned up at band practice expecting our maroon shirts, and we were, we were all handed out white ones and told there was no maroon left. So, right. <laughs> just, just put it on and go on the street. No, but I, rem I remember that. I, I vividly remember that that first parade just as a, a young boy. Bear in mind, I was 11, 12 years of age, probably 1981, I think it was, similar to uh -huh. yourself. Um, and I remember that. Vividly, the very, very, very first play that was brilliant. What, what, what was, what were you like with the night before? Were you buzzing the night before in terms of getting ready to go out, or you just waiting the whole night? <laughs> I was just waiting the whole night. My sons are still at that before an old film game. Right. Before an old film game, so a wee bit like that. I just nervous and getting uh -huh. up and taking your uniform, making sure it was all still there. So I just a bit of a nervous wreck, but thoroughly enjoyed it once we got there. Brilliant. And then afterwards, were you kind of were you glad it was over, or were you kind of like going, "Oh, really? Is that it?" I think you can, I think when once it's over, I think as a young boy, you can't wait for the next one. Mm. The main thing you're looking for, you know, when's the next one? How long's it got to go? Ticking the the boxes in the calendar, etc. 
Uh, and in sure. the days, again, you, you wouldn't have waited long for the next parade. There used to be still, they're still similar the day, maybe get a main parade on the Saturday and a church parade on the Sunday. Uh -huh. um, back in the days, again, if it was just June, July time, you kind of had a parade every week leading uh -huh. up to the, you know, the other parades and things. So I think just sure. looking down the clock, looking forward to the next one. Trying to improve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how long did it take? Obviously, when you walk with a band, you weren't sporting all their tunes. You know, how, how long did it take you to kind of develop to the point where you were pretty competent and, and confident with it, with all that the band was doing? I don't. I, I honestly don't remember it taking that long um, mm -hmm. because of the amount of practice that that you put in at that time as a young boy. I mean, we never had yeah. we game consoles. We never had mobile phones. We never had nothing, you know. If you wanted to use the the phone in the house, you'd ask for the key for the lock on the phone and stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was you never you never really had much to do apart from running about playing football and stuff, and then in the house practicing yeah. the flute. So you were at it constantly. Um, yeah. I don't think I would have been any more than 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 a year been able to play the, the kind of repertoire at that time, um, because there was a few there was a few boys all at the same age. We all went to school together and things, and we all kind uh -huh. of grew up with the band at the start. Um, sure. so they, where they've been kind of pushing each other all at the same time um, to try and get get learning and stuff. So I don't think it would have taken any more than a year. No, that Mr. McPherson, he's still learning, he tells me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I had to laugh at him talking about him getting the scale, you know, and <laughs> I look at him to get rid of that. <laughs> I know, so, so you've spent, you mentioned there about, you know, spurring each other on. I, I think for me, whenever I was doing it, it was, I wanted to make sure that I was finished before other people. I yeah. went because we had the list kind of thing. I was like, kind of going, I'm getting this tune down before anybody else does. Or, you know, because there was people still in the learners class who had joined the bond before me, yeah. I was like, kind of going, I want to get stuff done. I want to push through and, uh, you know, get this this knocked off the list. And one of the guys that um, I went to the bond with and I said, he used to deliver in the corner for me. And uh, I would have always, be headed round at some nights and, and to see whether he was practicing because I would have always been I would be like yourself, always practicing. I used to have a skylight in my room and I'd have had that open and all so so that he could hear how I was progressing and stuff, you know. <laughs> but what I do remember is is just dying, you know, to get out of the learners the learners room as quickly as possible. I remember old Charlie, old Charlie Hayes had a, an old golden retriever. Uh, right. and it looked be it used to be a randy old bugger, so we'd always try and take to your leg if you were in the learner's class. So you couldn't get out, wait to go out the learner's class to get rid of the dog to get the dog out. <laughs> no, but it was, we were probably six or seven years old, just of an age group at that time. Uh, and I think we did all push each other on. Uh, and they were, they were boys that stayed in the band for a, you know, a long time. Um, and yeah. still to this day, Remy's still here, me and Remy for these days. So there's still a couple of us in the band for, you know, back at that time. But... Well, sure. definitely, you kind of spurred each other on and you wanted to get away for that dog, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine you going home. What, what's that stain on your leg, son? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh, uh, dear. So, in terms of those early days, uh, you, you've mentioned, obviously, Charlie Hayes there. Are there any other guys that from that period that stand out for you as being somewhat inspirational or people who you would have considered to maybe even almost be like a mentor type figure to you, you know, when you when you were going through that learning process. Yeah, there's, there was loads of guys in the band too who were known, you know, throughout the the kind of Orange Institution or the, the Blacks. One of the founder members, John Gibson, would only be the provincial grand um, grand master in Scotland. Right. They uh -huh. were kind of heavily involved. Um, Archie Hayes as well, who was Charlie's son. Archie was an inspirational leader of the band for for years and years and years. Uh, and thankfully, he's actually still living the day. He's the last surviving yeah. founder member. Uh, right, okay. still with us. So, um, Big Cass, but everybody in, in their days knew Big Cass. Um, you know, thank you for saying it, but he's an old pest. <laughs> <laughs> but there's loads of guys, you know, even Stevie and Steve Addison and Jackie on the drums and um, Big Bill Guthrie in the bass drum, Big Toby in the bass drum. These were guys that were legendary in the band scene, probably here, but they were known all over the place. Uh -huh. um, so there was loads of guys, there was loads of characters in the band. Um, you know, you never knew what, what they were going to do next when you were out and about, what they were up to. Or the band went to do a parade in Ayrshire one day and they all turned up off the train still with their uniforms for the church parade the next day and stuff. And right. just, you know, absolute characters. Um, uh -huh. Probably most of the stories you couldn't broadcast, but you know, there, was, <laughs> there was loads of them. There wasn't one or two, there was just a whole band full of characters. Um, right. 
And thankfully, really? there's still quite a few of them ways, still quite a few of them that we see, still quite a few of them turn up. You could make two bands um, the day of the big walk given in Springburn every year uh -huh. with the old faces that you meet and stuff. Um, so uh, there's still quite a few of them cutting about the day. Brilliant. And what about some of your stuff? I know you said there about, you know, maybe some stories unfit for broadcast and stuff, but but what are some of your maybe standout memories from those early days, you know, in terms of, is there anything that kind of comes to mind you kind of go, I'm glad that happened, or I'm glad I was there whenever that happened? <laughs> probably missed it with you, probably shouldn't have been there when it happened. <laughs> 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 we did, the, the band went through kind of quite a, quite a, a tough time i think in the 80s it's fair to say and if it wasn't for, like, for lots of guys like archie and big Cass and that then yeah, there might not have been a band to this day so it was the band was full of a lot of young lads all kind of growing up we know much today and things and in the days you would go on trips to playing clubs all over scotland on a saturday night uh -huh. and we'd come back with a bus and there might not have been much left of the bus by the time it came back and, and things right. like that so um, but i was it was a wee bit rowdy to say the least in the days but uh -huh. And we didn't really carry a very good reputation. And I remember meeting a, a grandmaster a few years back and he'd seen the band and he'd, he came up to me and went, Whoa, oh, band's unrecognizable for what it was, you know, a few years yeah. back. Um, uh -huh. But it, was, it, took, it took a long time to get that kind of reputation um, changed and, and turned around. Um, uh -huh. But it's, it's definitely been, it's been worth that without a doubt. But standard meetings then would just have been, you know, parading with the band, doing the big walks and the crowds that used to follow the band. I mean, we would get two and three thousand people following the band all over the place and right, okay. there's all videos for the 80s cutting about on youtube and things and you just see crowds and crowds and crowds mm -hmm. of the bands um but i they would they would be kind of stand out you know kind of moments for me brilliant so you you've mentioned and i don't want to focus in on the the negative side in terms of the band having a reputation i'd rather focus in on the positive of how you change that around for yourself so obviously you were there journey you've just mentioned that you were there during up what are you consciously aware of that the bond did to turn that around? Because I know that whenever I, I spoke to Andy McAdam in the Black Skull, he mentioned one particular period where there was a there was some I think there was somebody, a couple of people drunk in the ranks, and there was people laughing at the bond from the side of the road because of the stadium. And he said from that point on, he says, No one will ever laugh at this bond again. Yeah. And no one will ever do anything that will bring the reputation of this bond and the Distribute. Did you have was it that kind of revelation stuff for you, or what? How did you handle that whole shift for yourselves? Again, I think it was a progression for where the band was there and, and where the uh -huh. band scene was. To be honest with you, at that point in time, um, but you know, bands were starting to you know really improve in terms of standards. Bands were starting to improve in terms of dress and yeah. decorum and obviously playing ability and things like that as well. And I think that all helped at that point in time. Whereas before that, it was it was more of a you know. A, Kind of rowdy boys day out with the shirts and things and you know the uh -huh. guys all over your ranks and things like that and it started to come in we we, we started to, to kind of work hard on the decorum i think in the band at that point in time uh, and just the overall you know bands appearance and playing ability and things like that um, but it's i mean it was hard a lot of bands that's when the band would probably start to dwindle in numbers a wee bit because right. it did become a bit stricter um, mm -hmm. So a lot of boys weren't they, you know, weren't they keen on that for talking sake, so they, they would have kind of left or went to join other bands or, sure. or went and done something else. So I don't think there was like a standout moment at that point in time again. I would just have been a young guy then. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just remember that that kind of progression, if you like, going for that that blood and thunder with the, the you know, the shirts with the, the open neck shirts and things like that, and, and people being allowed to just get absolutely hammered and things on parade and stuff. But there was definitely a clamp doing on that. Uh -huh. And I think that was a that's when it started to change. Um, when likes of the Black Skull, for example, came in and started to really, you know, push the push the the, the, the barrier, if you like, and, and you know, improve the standards and stuff in terms of dress and decorum and everything that came with that whole mm -hmm. whole bit. And I think a lot of bands picked up at that point in time as well um, and started to see the bigger picture. Yeah, uh, which I had to do because I don't think it could keep going the, the way that it was at that point in time. It had to yeah. start moving, you know. There was a period there through the eighties, late seventies and eighties, when the, the band just became more of a big, a big kind of social thing. It was like uh -huh. a social gathering for for boys for areas and boys for areas as well, all over different parts of Glasgow. They wouldn't know each other and things like that as well. Yeah. Um, so it was more there was a kind of tribal thing there as well in terms mm -hmm. of the bands at that point in time. 
But I think I don't think I think it was a good thing with that, you know, kind of progression away from that. Definitely yeah. where the where the standards are in the band scene now. Mm. Um, it's only testament to that, to you know, to what happened there and, and to move things forward. Yeah, no, I think when you I think you're right there. I think that some part of that late seventies, early eighties part there would have been a danger that the scene could have imploded on itself, yeah. you know, in terms of it could have just become a real a mess. Because yeah. I know, having spoken to some bands, you know, it was like you never knew who was going to turn up. You know, you, you said you were. I heard I heard a few stories of bands and saying, "Well, they, they turn up at the at the start of the the big walk, and maybe they'd have four drums and ten flutes. But by the time they made their way towards where the start real starting route of the thing, the band would have grown and yeah. size. People just tended to fall in wherever they wanted and yeah. all that kind of stuff. You know, it was like kind of going. I was I would have gone. I would never have got away with that. Like if I had turned up late, um, even in that that early eighties period, if I had turned up late and just kind of decided I was going to fall into the ranks about halfway around a parade or something like that. There, you got your ear clipped. Yeah, See, it was that was like that. Here was a bit of free for all, as you see. You would start with four drummers, and before you know it, half an hour, forty minutes later, they had twelve drummers. They'd been phoning uh-huh. taxis or phoning a party for the night before or, or whatever. It was just it was definitely merely a, a social thing for a lot of the, the band uh-huh. scene at that point in time. And tribal, as I say, is where boys had the you know this band was for this area, and yeah. that's kind of where they went. But the the actual kind of the decorum, if you like, and the standards weren't were nowhere near what they are just now. Um, yeah, I know it was it was far slacker. And you're right. I mean, it could have you know the band scene could have imploded unless it did change at that point in time, because yeah. it did drag on. That that period probably dragged on for 10, 12 years, I would say, before mm. it really started to turn the corner um, and looked more towards the kind of standards. I feel like. Yeah, and even even though the, hub, the bonds have changed in that regards, there's almost an element where some of the the residue from that period still sticks, doesn't it? You know, there, there's still some of that kind of stigma attached to it, even though it is quite it is quite different um, yeah. in terms of how it's set up. So you've obviously been through a number of transitions with the bond. Talk me through what that's been like, because obviously what you're, you've said a couple of times um in regards to being standard kind of being t-bond to where you are today is like it's a million miles away from from those yeah. those two points um where did that all start who was the instigator behind moving towards who you are today and how smoothly or unsmoothly did that process go i think it took about a time it was just a decision made probably early noughties i would say um, that the band wanted to try and move into a, a kind of different direction in terms of, you know, getting involved in melody and, um, and introducing parts into some of our, you know, our tunes, our arrangements. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that would have been, Robert McDavid would have been the chairman, who I was the chairman of the band for a, a long, long time. Um, and obviously the, the rest of the members, that obviously they just decided at that point in time when we approached Davy Hartness, I don't know if you know Davy. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm aware of Davy, I. We approached Davy and Davy, we kind of helped the band out for probably best part of eight years uh, right. and introduced us to that that side of things obviously David kind of can conduct his own parts and things like that but we we kind of get involved in that for about eight years but it was just everything was just played on a b flat so we'd just play you know kind of first flute setting third part harmonies and even the you know the kind of piccolo sections mm-hmm. of parts of like we still have been played in a, a b flat so we never introduced F flutes and piccolos and things to further down the line. Um, right. And that would have been after Davy's time when we'd, we'd made that decision and, and kind of get involved in that. But Davy uh-huh. was good for the band, you know, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, he was good for the band through that period. And the band became very strong in terms of, you know, indoors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of indoor arrangements, like Magnificent Men and all the things, which are still with, with the, the wee kind of whistle and all that uh-huh. type of stuff. Going on, but it was good for the band and it was good for the boys in the band and it you know it cut, encouraged them to to kind of learn and you know really get involved in it um, and it was good but at, at that time i felt that we were learning a lot of indoor stuff a lot mm. of indoor arrangements but it, nothing was really kind of progressing on the street in terms sure. of being a marching band and yeah. my view on it is that first and foremost we've got to be a marching band that's uh-huh. what we're we've got to have a presence on the street. We, you know, we need to be looking after that side of things as well. So, once we get through probably 2009-10, we we discussed and decided to introduce air flutes. Um, right. By a so we bought a whole new set um, of a Pete Worrell. Pete Worrell. Right, okay. Uh huh. 
been one of the first bands to have them, I think, way back then. So we introduced that so again. That was like starting from scratch, you know, getting uh -huh. boys to pick up and learn to play the F flute and learn to play and introduce the piccolo into the band and, and learn to play all the different, um, you know, arrangements and things that we were bringing in there. And uh -huh. most of them, and even up to the day, most of that stuff would, would, would come for Laurie, Laurie uh, Johnston. Laurie uh -huh. does a lot of stuff for us. Um, and I'm, always, I'm always pestering them for mayor. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's precious. But he's obviously, he's great. Laurie's fantastic for the band team. Uh, yeah. Know, um, it's mad, isn't it? Because I, I, and Laurie's, uh, Laurie's a force of nature when it comes to flutes and arrangements and things they got there. Do you know what I mean? And, and I suppose, I mean, I, I don't, I had a convers I've had a number of conversations with him over the, over the years and stuff. Um, obviously had him on the podcast as well. And, uh, he, a very opinionated man as well, isn't he? he? He knows what he likes and what he doesn't like and isn't afraid to let you know. Um, but what a talent, what a talent he is. You know I mean? You listen to his YouTube channel, um, that Avondale flutes and drums. I mean, the, the guy plays everything. He's, he's it's absolutely, fantastic. yeah. yeah. Absolutely. He's Brilliant. fantastic. The, the trick for me is to try and, again, there's, there's lots of bands using, using Lori. Uh, uh -huh. And if we're all just getting the same arrangements and same parts off them and things, then I, I like to try and keep it different. Whereas I'll send Lori maybe like recordings of like some maybe three uh -huh. or four tunes pulled together and asking to write parts to that. So we're still sure. trying to differentiate what we get off them. Uh -huh. uh, and that just keeps it, it keeps that wee bit fresh for us as well. Don't get me wrong. If you just want a traditional march off them, yeah. You know, Parts that he's writing for that march, but uh, there's quite a few things that we'll try and introduce our own kind of slant on that, and they'll write parts uh -huh. for it, um, and, and deal with that. So I know he's been, he's been brilliant. He's been absolutely superb for us. I know he'd be. I, I don't want. I, I was going to. I don't want to talk to you about it as if he's he's not going to be around for much longer. But you know, but he'd be a big mass. He'd be a loss to the scene. You know, at some point, you know, down the line, you know, because there's not too many people. Knocking about with that kind of knowledge, that kind of talent, that kind of ability. I mean, it's 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 ridiculous. It's scary what he can come it's up scary, with. Yeah. Yeah, it's scary, and they're few and far between. I mean, yeah. well, obviously, there's all the websites and things floating about. You can get stuff yourself. But again, if you're looking for something unique to you, unique to your band, there's not that many places you can actually go and say, "There's a wee kind of first arrangement." Can you, you know, yeah. put a nice part to that for us? So. Um, but uh, the, the band progressed there and, and moved on, and it probably took us. We lost a lot of members again there. Uh -huh. and what I find here is that the membership, the numbers in our band, is up and down and up and down. In terms of you know playing members, we've always got we've always got a decent, healthy learner class. Uh -huh. um, you, if you, you know, if you got a few boys there, you might get a couple out of it because they're, they're yeah. three of them will fall by the wayside and different things. But sure, you know, we always get to the stage. You're kind of reinventing the wheel every couple of years in a band like ours where. You know, boys that are playing, maybe playing the F flute and getting quite competent at it for a couple of years, uh -huh. and then it'll disappear. And you're reinventing that, you know, constantly. You're, you're, you're just kind of um, running back over old ground again and just yeah. trying to keep that depth of sound in the band as much as you can. Uh huh. No, I remember taking learner's class for a while myself. And one of the things that used to bug me, especially with being in a melody band, was teaching young, young lads how to play the flute. And then after they got themselves through a whole whack of tunes with you when you started to move into marches with them they all cleared off the blood and thunder bonds where they kind of go on now nah, well, i'll have a lot of that so it's like we yeah. used to have a running joke is you you start off with and it, it, when i was just out on the, the learners class and bomb my car defenders they kind of go and you, you go and get your start with us and you go and join another bomb you know it was uh, i don't know why you have that or not but it was uh i used to annoy me it was like it does it happens i mean i, I mean we have we have a area in the, the north of glasgow you know and we still carry on average and about 30, 32 bodies every year uh -huh. between learners and flutes and drums and things. And that's always kind of average about these sort of numbers. Um, but it's no, a melody band in this area is not that fashionable for any right. young guy want to come in. Young guys still want to go and they want to get into the, you know, the good quality kick bands, the bigger bands and things like that. Right. So we try to introduce them and teach them in and maybe try to teach them some second parts to introduce them to a couple of tunes and things. Mm -hmm. It's not really that fashionable. Um, I know. They then go out and see all the, the the kind of big bands walking out there, making a, you know making loads of noise and things like that. That still seems to be the the fashionable thing. Yeah, I know it is, and I, I, and you know what? But what I'm finding as well is a lot of those bigger bands. You know, there's only so far you can go with that as a style. And I think you know when it, when you look at some of those big bands, they're they're actually introducing elements of melody into their their playing. I mean, I think of even bands like the Gertrude Star here. 
you know, I've introduced a number of tunes into their repertoire that have got some of the best parts that I've heard on tunes. Yeah. Um, East Belfast Protestant Boys as well have been doing things around parts and stuff like that there, you know, and, and that and that's that's great, you know, because that's for me it's there's not too many other places you can go once you've kind of, you know, done your arrangements and changed your tunes up and you know, made them in some instances unrecognizable. That you know, there's not too many other places you can go for development. And I think there's there's probably a couple of bands over here starting to do that type of thing as well, just introducing some wee, you know, just a wee counter melody into their, their kind of flutes and things. So it definitely uh-huh. it's good. It's, it's progress without a doubt. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's loads of good B T bands it's still here in Glasgow and Lanarkshire and things like that. Uh-huh. And, and it's good to see that some of that starting. They don't need to go full, you know, three, four part harmonies and things, but just introduce yeah. an extra wee bit. Um, yeah. There's quite a few just B T tunes that we would still play now that we've just introduced a wee second stroke third yeah. part. Just to get that extra wee bit of depth instead of going full blown um, uh-huh. kind of four part arrangements and things on them. So uh, yeah, but it's definitely good to see, I without a doubt. No, definitely. I think, I think it's great. And I think it progresses and you know, and some of the, the most innovative stuff coming out is seeming least a lot of it's coming from some of the blood and thunder bonds, you know, some of the tunes that they're and arrangements that they're coming out with are extremely inventive and you know, um and, and creative and stuff, you know, and I think that that's that that's great. And great that they're introducing other elements too. You mentioned that you switched the world flutes. Um, did what did you notice that changed about the bomb whenever you moved to those style of flutes? Because I was talking to I was actually talking to Peter the other night there, and we're talking about you know just you know the influence that he's had on on the scene and stuff as well in terms of with those flutes. Yeah. What did you get out of switching to those type of instruments? I think we definitely go far better quality we got a different tone to the band completely i just mm-hmm. think the world, the bottle flutes got a you know a kind of different tone to it and if you can get them all tuned nicely then they, they can be really sweet and crisp absolutely but what we did get for i can't even remember what we had before that but what i do remember is you know replacing keys and replacing pads and replacing everything and when mm-hmm. we did switch to waddle they just worked yeah you know, they just worked you just lifted it blew it and it just worked and if it, even to this day, some 12 years later, maybe 13 years, occasionally you'll send your flute away for a wee service and different things like uh-huh. that. We still have very, very few issues with them. Yeah. Um, you know, the breaking or pads falling off and different things, even probably the uh-huh. lack of use of the last couple of years, probably uh-huh. just cupboards and drawers and things like that during COVID. Sure. Just a, a absolute quality instrument. That's my view. I don't know if it's probably sure. my view, but I think... I think it made a big difference to your band, without a doubt. No, I definitely. I, I agree. I mean, I have a couple of world flutes myself. You know, I mean, Art, my, my own band doesn't play them. They play the play Miller Wicks, but uh, um, my own stuff. I, I just find the tone that comes off the world flute the, as you're saying, it's a wee bit sweeter. You know, it just for me, it's it's very pleasing to the ear yeah. and yeah. an effortless flute to play. Um, yeah. There doesn't it doesn't take too much. To fill that there, and I suppose the other thing is I also hear that about his F flutes. You know that the F flutes are, and he even talks about that himself. He says that the F flute is probably the, the, the instrument that he's most proud of that he's produced for the band, saying because of you know the the tone that he gets from it and the the, the fact that it it really does add to a band's you know uh, a band sound and stuff. And you obviously you're playing Warl F sound as well, are you? We've got, or, we've got three F side, but as I say, sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes you've got one, sometimes you've got two, sometimes uh-huh. you've got three if we're lucky. 2017 with three good strong players and what a difference it made to the, the sound of the band. Um, yeah. But no, I definitely, I've got I've got a crown AZF, which uh-huh. I can have as well and I can play that and that, that tunes in with the world, the world yeah. as well, but no, well, it's a quality instrument now. Yeah, it was quality. I just picked up a crown F as well there about maybe about a month ago. Um, yeah. Happened to be browsing uh, on eBay, and then realized that the guy selling it was a guy that used to be in Ball McCart Defenders and I, and part of Ball and Ron. Uh-huh. Uh, I think straight on, I think on this will be a well a well kept instrument, you know. But it, some of the crowns are hit and miss, aren't they? You know, and, and one of the things I was talking because was, I was talking to Peter about this, and he was saying that the difference between a good crown and a bad crown, he says, is purely down to the condition that you get it in. Yeah. You know, if it's you know, if there's long term wear on it, you know, regardless of whether the name is on it, doesn't necessarily mean yeah. that it's a it's a quality instrument. It's all come down to how well it's been cared for, yeah. how well it's been looked and, after. Yeah, 
I think when I got mine, that's probably it must be about ten years ago now. I sent it down to Pete. Um, uh -huh. and that's to you know look at the pads and everything on it and, and kind of reconditioning it a wee bit like that. And it's it's never been back to him since. Uh -huh. uh, and again, just like that, you can take it out and it just works. But again, if, if it's cared for, in the in the past, a lot of these things would just have been thrown in a draw. You know that yourself in the crownies. Yeah. It was, it would have been the Bora flute or some of the things. They, they wouldn't have been looked after. They'd have been thrown in a somebody's sock drawer when they, they kind of got up the road. But the thing Aye. with the me is we spend, we spend that wee bit of time, every time before we go, just, just heating them up and spending that wee five minutes just tuning them. I'll always tune them off in my flute. Go uh -huh. meet some individual guy in the band and tune it. And it, it just tends to work for us. Absolutely. There have never yeah. any major issues with them. They're just they're good. And as you say, they're, they're easy to blow. Um, yeah. So, and it, for us, they just work. Absolutely. No, and I think anybody that does have them says exactly the same thing. And I mean, they send it there. I mean, I have, I have, I have a number of Miller Works flutes as well. And they're just, you know, some of them are just as easy to play, you know, in regards to... But I, and I, I have to be careful here because I'm going to have... Uh, I'm going to have Paul... On from Miller works on the podcast pretty soon as well, you know. So um, I think it's just for me they're 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 two two very different instruments, you know, and and in terms of what sound and tone that you get from them, yeah. I, I do have a slight preference from a world's, but um, I, I you know obviously playing a Miller work with the, the Raven, I just I just have to you have to get on with it, you know. I think if there's anything with the, the world, I would say if anything, it maybe just lacks a wee bit of volume. Um, mm. but for in volume it definitely makes up for in tone if you can get them. And I, I think for me there's there's something there as well whenever you're talking about volume and stuff I, I see if you have if you've got 14 15 flutes that are all playing very nicely in that mid register they're not squeaking yeah. the life out of the flute and stuff you're going to get your volume because yeah. you're covering the full tonal range you know you've got you know either your single or double snare drums that you're you're using well-tuned bass drum and then if you're playing a range of different parts plus you've got f some piccolo and stuff yeah. you're getting that full tonal range from the flute and i think that that goes a long way when you consistently play good in those those registers that yeah. does something to the overall you know sound of the bond sound and the balance of the bond definitely i think that's yeah. the key thing, getting that balance and getting the depth the depth of the you know the actual tuning all the different parts and make sure everything's coming across and that that's yeah. a challenge for us to make sure that you've got enough second players enough f players and everything else into the bargain so yeah, as i say is that again this year we're kind of reinventing the wheel starting pretty much starting again with the f section right okay yeah, introducing another couple of boys on it and just taking them through it again so yeah so, and that that's that's the issue but it's again you're, you only get out of what you put into it don't you that's well, that's it. You know what I mean, and, and it's you know, and, and sometimes you know you you have to take stock of where you are, what you're, what what you have available to you in terms of personnel, and what's the best way of using this. You know, do I need to switch some people around? You know, are there some guys that are on parts at the moment that I that, you know maybe need to go on the first and give us a really good strong, you know, melody base first and foremost, and then you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes use your learners to, you know, if they're near there, listen, we'll, we'll put you on some parts and stuff. These may be easier to pick up than some of this, and it makes it, you know, it's a real, it's a jigsaw at times to try and, you know, keep that stuff together. Yeah. Isn't it? It's a challenge, isn't it? And it's, a, it's a challenge for other boys as well in the band and trying to integrate them into the, the kind of flute section as they're learning, as you yeah. say, maybe trying to introduce them onto some second parts. Just nice, wee easy second parts to introduce them into things to get a feel for it. Uh -huh. But I would say we are, we're swapping guys about all the time, you know, and we've taken boys off the first this year and a boy off the seconds to introduce them to the F and starting uh -huh. through that. So you just go through all the, all the different stuff again. Every yeah. couple of years, this is where you're starting from scratch. But you've got to do it if you want to keep, yeah. you know, they keep that balance in the band as much as you can with the numbers that you've got, then that's the only way to do it. Yeah, and are you, are you doing a mix of you know sort of ABCs and music and stuff now, or what? what how you how you handling that? You know, because it's easier to switch people sometimes if they're music readers or whatever. What how you how you doing that? Most of the stuff, all the marches would come in, you know, kind of written music on, um, but any any of the old the old kind of B and T tunes that we had for years ago that we maybe just jigged a bit a wee bit or changed. Yeah. that will still be just like kind of simple system ABC. Yeah, right. But anything that we introduce in terms of like music and marches and things and stuff for Laurie, obviously, would, would come in as a score. Um, so right. we can get that in. Don't get me wrong, I know everybody in the band's, like, you know, sight reading. 
we'll uh-huh. still we'll be putting kind of notes and different things above the letters, but yeah, yeah, just to make sure that they're understanding the value of the notes and different things as well. Yeah, um, so well we've, we've done been doing that for a number of years now. Brilliant. No, I think that I think that's that's key for for some people in terms of being able to switch, you know, between instruments and parts and stuff, you know, recognizing that, you know, oh God, oh, I write enough here. That looks, that's, that's a held out note. That's a, no, there's three held over. No, that's actually four or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And I think that that's, it, it stands people in good, good stead, especially if you are looking to switch them about and, you know, play different parts, you know, sometimes having a bit of, well, not sometimes, all the time having a bit of musical notation knowledge and being able to recognize that helps out with those transitions. So the bond's obviously been around for it's seventy years this year, isn't it? These are yeah, celebrating a seventieth anniversary. Yeah. What have you got lined up in terms of marking that as as an event? There'll just be there'll be a few things throughout the course of the year which we're just still trying to decide and finalise. Um, we'll always have a you know an anniversary dance, for example. But the last time uh-huh. in '65 we had a parade. Um, but Springburn's not the best area for a parade because it's full of hills, so not a lot of people like then. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's point in Glasgow as you come through Springburn. So whether we do right. a parade or something, I'm not sure. Um, but right. we have a few things to market, definitely. But we're, we're looking to kind of introduce a kind of new uniform this year as well for first time right. in the last four or five years, I think. We were okay. A couple of years back, but then with the pandemic and everything like that, that just all get knocked in the head for everybody. So... Uh-huh. Uh, plan is to try and get that done this year as well um, and get that sorted out. The last way that we'd done in the, it's five years ago we went to the Somme as well in 2017, uh-huh. um, so we, we kind of mapped that 65th with something. I think uh-huh. we maybe caught a wee, a wee bit short here just with the, the 70th because of the pandemic, so before sure. we knew it, we were back practicing and the, the uh-huh. 70th was on us, so but no doubt we'll come up with something um, throughout the course of the year, definitely. Sure. Any Tip bits of information about the uniform is that a closely guarded secret? Kind of closely guarded at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> I have no chance of getting any information there. I know what it's like. See bonds and uniforms. It's like it's like the what it calls like the recipe for Coca Cola. You'll never get it off anyone. You know, <laughs> absolutely closely guarded secret for the time being. Definitely brilliant. No worries. Well, it, it's interesting too because there's been a lot of bonds that have been mentioned on the but on the podcast mentioned that they're you know they're heading for. New uniforms and stuff, you know. I know the Black Skull have headed for one, you know, and uh, um, I think Drum Durger actually heading for a new uniform mm-hmm. as well. Gertrude Star heading for new uniforms and stuff. So there's quite a lot of. I love seeing Bonds getting uniforms, you know, and and then surprising people, you know, with what they've come up with, you know, because people don't recognise who who the Bond is, you know. And I suppose our Bond done that last year. Um, they made a, you know, a, we'd obviously been wearing a, like a guards type uniform, not like the, not with the fleur de lis, but with uh, just a, you know, standard kind of dre- you know, guards dress with the red tunic and the blue and um, the treasures and stuff. So we went back to sort of like a deep navy with a uh, maroon trimming. But one yeah. of the things that they threw everybody this year was, or last year, was that they changed the drums. I mean, you, if you know the Raven, you know they, they carried the Royal Scots. Yeah. They, they they switched the white drums, and nobody had a ball. This notion who it was coming down the road. It was like it was like who's who's this here coming with white drums, and then when they seen it, it was like, geez, they pretty even have ditched have ditched those chrome drums, you know. So those, those chrome drums have been there from I think near enough the the bond, the bond started, you know. So a mass, massive departure, and I think it's great to see things like that where. Bonds through the crowd or through people a wee bit of a curveball, you know. And so it's good, I and it's, it's good again. It's an element of surprise, isn't it? You know, and that. Yeah. I, think that's, I mean, for years we were we, we were kitted out with the American Marines, um, you know, with the Navy jacket and the Royal. Yeah, yeah. And, like that. and then but five years ago we we changed to kind of RAF style. Um, uh uh-huh. And again, you know, you can see na- nobody's expecting it, and everybody's kind of looking mm-hmm. to see what it is and stuff. And that's good. That's a total change. That's just a total. Yeah. Change. Transformation, as you say, it does it throws people. Mm-hmm. Um, they they kind of don't know. So, but it's great for the boys in the band because it's you know it gets it gets that enthusiasm up. You know, the boys in the band looking forward to that as well, and it's it's a big thing for the anniversary and uh, learning some new tunes, some new arrangements, and things as well. Just to try to throw all that. Right. In. No, it, no, it is. It's good, man. I have to. I mean, I I think the RAF one's a great one, and obviously. The the Balmacarda way back had you know that that REF kind of blue thing going on, 
as well. I remember one of the, when when I first joined the, the bomber cart way back in the sort of it would have been what ninety one way back um, whenever I ended up with them and uh, they moved away from these blue uniforms with the Glengarries they used to wear and it almost looked more like an accordion bonds uniform rather than a flute bonds but they then switched to this RAF blue thing where you know with the pig caps and all this kind of stuff and it was such a departure no one had a bald these notion who the bomb was as they were they were walking up the road you know and even changed the bods and everything on the side everything kind of you know went and it was like whoa what's this all about you know it's it's great to be great to be part of that yeah one of the things that we talk a lot about pat on the podcast is the positive influence that being a member of a bond has had on bond members lives and i suppose that's where like the the talk to you about it is is what kind of positives has being at a bond brought to your life what have you got out of it i've got a lot obviously one of the main ones would be like kind of friendship Mm-hmm. Yeah, the friends that you've made within the band, out with the band, um, you know, I think over, I think it's became the band community for likes a lot closer now than I think it's mm-hmm. ever been. Um, with things like social media and stuff like that, for example, it's, it's made you kind of know boys for other bands all over different parts of the country and bands sure. for all over Northern Ireland and things as well. You get you you kind of get that close knit mm-hmm. in terms of what it used to be because everybody just used to stick to their own area. And you kind of didn't you know so you develop friendship through bands through the years you know and i've always says to everybody i've been in a band 41 years 42 this year i think so mm-hmm. done me anyhow my three sons are in the band now they've grew up in it my three grandsons are in the band as right. well so now the, the kind of third generation and the band's kind of coming through so i think uh-huh. it's been fantastic you know taking young kids off of the street in an area like lake springburn for example i take great pride in that Mm-hmm. Get them off the street, teach them to you know play an instrument, teach them to read a wee bit of music, uh, maybe no in depth, but just you know trying to help them out, encourage them, give them somewhere to, to come and just give them that that comfort if you like. Because right. it's no it's no easy to walk up here and chop a door and join a band. Um, mm-hmm. we, can, we don't really get that a lot. It tends right. to be families or family members or different things. Um, I think maybe in the last five six years we've had one guy no known to the band that's came and joined the band. Uh-huh. It tends to be families or friends or cousins or, or something like that. So it's definitely sure. a, more of a kind of family community. But no, just through the years, it's it, I take great pride in the band. You know, for where the where it was uh-huh. as a boy joining it to where the band is now to the things we've done. Like, say, you know, going to the song would have been the, the best experience for me. A lot uh-huh. with the pleasure of you know playing and, and taking part in the, the ceremony at the Menning Gate and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Again, if you weren't in a band, you would probably never even be near these places. You know, yeah. the kind of tours and things like that. So they're they're all massive positives for me, and even the, and the rest of the boys in the band, and take younger boys to experience that type of thing as well. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Definitely. You mentioned the wee bit there about you know band membership and people being unknown to the band, you know, coming in as generally families. Do you think bands need to do something about that in order to increase the 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 range of people coming on or widen the net? I suppose, or do you think if there's always strong family ties, the bonds will survive? I think the bonds will survive through strong family ties. I definitely do. It's hard. It's kind of hard to market your band um, when you're getting alienated for every quarter mm. in terms of you know politicians and everything in this country, which is absolutely you know horrendous. As far as yeah. normal Joe in the street now, they're just, we're just right right wing extremists. That's what they've managed to kind mm-hmm. of us. Um, what I look at is your your catchment area. And still young kids that are maybe going to school here and you know but their, their family members are in the band and we, we try to do that and we try to be out uh-huh. in springburn in my own area as much as possible because sure. that is what area. that's where we kind of need to be um, to try and encourage membership but it's really hard to market that yeah um, here we are in a position in you know kind of glasgow at the minute whereas years ago you would have had loads of boys interested in bands but there wasn't a lot of things other activities that they were involved mm-hmm. in time likes the gaming and all these types of yeah. things. It becomes difficult. Yeah, and I, the other thing is, I think for me is, the, one of the things that I've talked to a couple of people about was, where I grew up, bonds were a constant thing on the street. You know, when yeah. I grew up in Tampa, I just grew up off Tampa Moore Avenue. So, for yeah. me, that would have been, you know, bonds would have been a standard part of everyday culture, you know what I mean? Or, well, every day, but every week or it would, it would have been prevalent in terms of being visible. 
Yeah. And what I find is now where I live now is that that's not the case, you know. And as a result of that, like I, my my wee lot who I would love to have got down to is has got no interest because there's yeah. no sense of this happens or seeing it around. You know, it's just like he he basically would have been the twelfth or the first of July because he'd have been dragged out to see his own dog walking, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, there's that, that kind of prevalence maybe is has had has an impact as well i don't know whether it's the same with you guys or not i think it is i think there would have been a, a much bigger presence with the, the parades you know mm-hmm. in years by i mean it, for in spring on the day of the big walk there might have been eight bands at one point in time now you're looking yeah. for two, maximum three and um, so the numbers have really dwindled in terms of whether, whether it be on's membership or the amount of bands that's on the street you know the, at times it was two or three bands for this area uh-huh. Uh, we're the only ones that's still here. We're the only ones that's been that constant. Um, yeah. but we're, we're probably knowing the street in our own area anywhere near as much as we would have been in the past. Right. Um, it would have been a big, big party you grown up in years sure. gone. Um, but it doesn't seem to be that now. And it seems to be, I think that's where it's changed. And it's more that, that kind of family tie. Like Matthew uh-huh. said, we're in the band, but, but if, I'd, you know, if I didn't have sons, then we wouldn't have had that link. Um, but they're quite yeah. happy. In the band, my grandsons love it as well. You know, they kind of parade uh-huh. and play symbols. The band's healthy in terms of other young kids. I think we've got about eight young kids at the minute where they're boys right, in yeah. the bands and things, you know, and Brilliant. they're all getting symbols and triangles and you know, that type of things just to keep their interest in it. But I think it's definitely changed I in terms of what the, the catchment would have been back then to what it is now. It's totally different. For sure. I know, and I, and I definitely think there's something that bonds need to be. Some bonds will need to think about in regards to how they do that, you know, because there's some, you know, maybe connections with schools, which is difficult to do as well. But there may, there's there's probably ways and means, you know, for, for things to be developed in a, in a way that's kind of seen as, you know, benefiting the community on the wider community rather than still being pigeonholed around all loyalist bonds. Yeah. That's not touched up with the barge pool. Well, and I think that's something that we've we've looked at as well, whether we're kind of helping out and promoting the local church, um, uh-huh. you know, and things, and then we're donating to charities and collections with, during the time of you know COVID and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So we donate stuff to the church. Uh, the, the, the local church of Scotland team now actually takes the parade back in the local church parade, whereas right, it didn't okay. the parade for years. Um, uh-huh. So actually accepting the parade back in last year. I remember this day we got to do a kind of drumhead service inside the church. Oh, very good. The kind of local MP and things like that was there uh-huh. as well. It's, it's definitely changing, um, but I think mm-hmm. the more we can do that, the better. And we try to help local community here in Springburn wherever we can. But you're right what you're saying, that's got to be inclusive. You know, yeah. You can't be pigeonholed into that, that kind of same box all the time. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the kind of difficult thing. We've got to change that public persona. Yeah. You, you know what we are basically that's it but, I mean, but that's a two-way street though pat isn't it I, that's not all down on the bonds i you yeah. know for me i kind of think that there's an element where yes bonds have a part to play in that but also the people who may be critical or have a particular view of the bonds also need to change in regards that for me is engaged and have some kind of relationship with the bonds because the standoff, standoff, don't talk to them, don't talk to them. All yeah. that does is continue to promote or at least not give an opportunity for the narrative to be to be challenged. And yeah. I think that, that for me is a is a major issue. How that happens though is is it how we how you do that and how they are maybe how other people are encouraged to engage with the bonds. That's that's a whole different story. Yeah, I think the first step in that process is to have a you know, first of all, a stronger voice collectively. Mm. Everybody involved in the you know the parading organisations over here, whether that's the Orms, the Blacks, Apprentice Boys, and the bands together, and um, to uh-huh. have a stronger voice to be united as well, and yeah. to move forward with everything. Um, instead, yeah. it's always you know, they've always seemed a wee bit distant at times, um, apart from each other. I know that's changed recently in the last few years, and there's been a lot uh-huh. of things in the last couple of years to try and change that. Yeah, and to bring these organisations, if you like, they're closer together. The guys at the top will know each other and maybe yeah. share a lot of information. But I think that's where it's got to start. Um, so it's kind of more coherent, if you like. So you mm. get the message right across to everybody. And it's it's no it's no kind of rules for one and rules for others to a certain extent. But I think yeah. it, needs, yeah, it needs that strong voice. But that's got to be guided to everybody. And it's got to be a clear message that comes across yeah. to everybody that's involved in the, the parade and yeah. organisation. 
Definitely. I think there's a sense of, you know, you talked about how the bond scene seems to become stronger and more collaborative over the years. And I think that's right, right across the board. There's been a, a sense of that and that we need to, to have each other's backs a lot more. And I think you get that, you know, from, you know, the way the bonds interact with each other now. And I, and I definitely think that the, the orders need to come on board in that regard too. You know, that there needs to be this sense that, you know, this sense of that we're independence, which is a dirty word in Scotland, I know. Um, but uh, you know the old idea of, but we're we're no man as an island, no organisation as an island. We're 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 dependent on each other. You know, we need the bonds need the orders just as much as the orders need the bonds. Mm-hmm. And there's definitely got to be something there that that strengthens that sense of connectedness between the two in regards to that we have a strategy going forward together. Yeah. That you know that the health of the bond scene is 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 intrinsically linked to the health of the order and vice versa if you you've got an unhealthy order then that's going to impact the bonds in some shape or form you know and there's there's definitely got to be something done i think in regards to increasing the level of closeness between the bonds and the orders yeah i think i mean i would agree with that 100 percent definitely and it comes through whether it's the the kind of band associations over here been able to Mm -hmm. you know more you know discussions if you like with it the top of the, the orange order or the apprentice boys association or the blacks whatever that might be but the only way it's going to work is to try and you know pull all these organizations closer together and um, yeah. to have more dialogue more discussion agrees agree ways forward for whether yeah. that's trading or promoting in different yeah. areas you know promoting that your local areas everybody should be here promoting collecting and doing what we can to help charities and, and yeah. all the rest of it. but it's got to be collective it's yeah. absolutely the collective and then it's going to be shouted for the hilltops you know in well, that's it. Absolutely. Yeah. to show all the good things that's, that's getting done because there is a lot of good things getting done uh, yeah probably just not getting anywhere near the publicity that it should be at the minute i know so, a stronger voice and nobody get that yeah and that's where you live in a wee kind of a paradox though pat don't you because it's like bonds are doing lots of great things but they're not doing charity work to share about it you know really but at the same time, we probably we should be because there is maybe a, an idea that you know that people don't see that in, in, in the bond scene as well. So it almost puts people on the sometimes it, I think it puts people on a back foot, you know, and they kind of go on, well, we're actually doing this because we want to, we don't, we're not really doing this to, to get publicity for ourselves and whatever else. And that's where you kind of have to there, again, we talked about balance and bonds, but there's a balance in that too, isn't there? Where you kind of go, I don't want to exploit this because it's expedient for us and that, that helps our image but because the real reason why we're doing it is because we want to help people and but yet there's nothing wrong with saying we're helping people there's nothing wrong with saying and i think the, i think on the other hand you're you know the bands or the the, the orders whoever they're being exploited at every opportunity mm. in this, by politicians and local councillors or whoever that might be so the more good publicity you can get the better yeah whatever that is so if you're doing a collection or you're, you're running you know, a fund for a particular um, area, this where we are in Springburn. It doesn't matter what that is. If they accept that off you, great, it's good publicity. If they don't want yeah. to accept it, you, then it's still good publicity in a roundabout way for us because yeah. you know, it's, it's discriminating against people. So I think that's, to me, that's that's the way forward. A much stronger voice, a much unified voice in terms of everybody working together. Because you're right with the saying, the bands need the orders, the orders need the bands. You know, it's all, it's, it's, it's got a kind of main collective aim at the end of the day isn't it to try and get up yeah definitely i I definitely think and there's a lot of bonds that are starting obviously you know do certain things like i know like the gertrude star they 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 were involved some of their ex members they informed a lodge you know called i think it's the gertrude street defenders and stuff was the name of their lodge and they're becoming no they're probably one of the biggest lodges in belfast now and they're not they're not up and running that long you know or other bonds have you know decided that because they're taking the same lodge you know for years upon years members of the bond are deciding that they're going to that they're joining the lodge as well you know so they're doing that two-prong thing and i think that that's a really healthy approach that you know people can take you know i know that there's people involved in lodges outside of that but i think there's something about bonds making that strong connection a strong bond with a particular lodge especially if they have a long-term relationship with them you know and i suppose by becoming members of that lodge you're, you're doing something to ensure it stays healthy and that their relationship with with the bond is is, is, is healthy i mean i think now looking back probably you know mid 80s you would have probably 90 percent of the band would have been onsman at that uh-huh. point 
you're looking at the band new, that would probably be around about the 10% mark. There uh-huh. there. Um, I think in, in Scotland or the west of Scotland in particular, I think the, the the bands have got a stronger connection to the Apprentice Boys in terms of membership. Okay. Uh, been kind of connected to the, the Apprentice Boys. Yeah, uh-huh. so there's probably seven or eight of our boys in the, the local Apprentice Boys Club and then there's other boys in other Appre- Apprentice Boys right. Clubs. In the country. There's a much more higher percentage of membership going towards mm-hmm. the Apprentice Boys than the, what there is in the Orange. Um, but what what the reason behind that is, who knows? If you only, the way I look at it is you, you've got one Apprentice Boys Club in one area, whereas mm-hmm. in the area here you might have five or six different lodges. So you've got one club in one area that's probably got a you know a better voice, sure. you know, a better chance of success than what all the individual lodges are that's joining. Mm-hmm. But a good connection with the boys uh, at two six eight here that we've worked with probably for the past five or six years, and there's a couple of the boys in the band that are in the the lodge as well. So um, how that swings about in terms of interest to get boys to join mm-hmm. the, the orange, I don't know. I'm not sure how that works, but again that. Something that you should be discussing at a, you know, a more kind of collaborative level, if you like, between you. Yeah. How can we promote membership? You know, through these. these yeah. Different- or it, even just something along the lines of just history and heritage. I think that there's a big part for you know bonds and the or- the orders to work together just in regards to knowing where you've come from. Because I think that that's re- it's really really important that you know your history, not just for the sake of. It's not about you know, winning or losing or whether you, you know, that kind of thing. I think that there's something strong about knowing where your identity actually really comes from. Why Why are you involved in this? Why is this, why are these two things in, intrinsically linked? I think that that's really important because what the history does for me is validates the tradition, yeah. you know, because if you, you know where you've come from and you know where these things have generated from, then those two things lock together to become a unit rather than here's your history Here's your tradition, and most people don't know where they where they cross over or why. It's education, isn't it? it comes down to yeah. edu- educating boys in bands, educating you know boys in lodges and, and different mm-hmm. things. That there's there's a massive impact um, in terms of a lack of education. If you like, through yeah. and people not understanding the, the you know the real history of why they're here or promoting their culture and, and different things. Yeah, like that. yeah. I think no. all, as you say, just more kind of collaboration between everybody. Yeah, definitely. And 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 I think whenever you put that together with the likes of your history, your heritage, your tradition, and then this idea of giving back that we've been talking about, you know, the good work that bonds do, I think that that's a powerful we were you were talking about maybe not maybe having a marketing strategy, but maybe that is a powerful marketing strategy is here's your history, here's why your tradition is important. And as a result of that, we're giving back to people, you know, because we want to you know, show that there's a there's a reason why we're involved in some one of these things. Link back to the whole idea of the Reformation, which is where the whole a lot of our stuff comes from. Yeah. Is that there there are principles attached to the whole idea of, you know, treating people in a in a better way or treating people in a way that you know forwards respect all that kind of stuff. You know, which is not what we're really known for. As I suppose, I suppose we're seen as being disrespectful as opposed to being respectful a lot of a lot of time so i think there's 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 a lot of stuff forward in my head over the last couple of years in regards to you know maybe doing certain things in the podcast is one aspect of that you know it's like kind of going for me it's about connecting with real people and not everybody is going to have the opportunity to sit down with with you pat or to sit down with anybody and have this type of conversation and hear how you got involved hear how you know important your family is to you and you know what you've got out of this as a, a you know as a as a person that this goes beyond music it goes beyond anything it goes beyond politics it goes beyond whatever there's a lot more to this than meets the eye and if people aren't having those kind of conversations maybe something like the podcast gives people a wee insight into you know what what real people who are involved in this are really like yeah, what what kind of makes it tick i mean the problem you've got here in glasgow the west of scotland where We've been absolute, we've been vilified at every turn. The, mm. ones, the politicians have been pretty clever for years over here at just turning the general public um, against everything that we do, everything that we stand for on the street, everything that we parade for. And as I said earlier, you just feel as though you're being just branded an extremist um, mm. you know, for going out and parading on the street. So it's a difficult fight here. It's yeah. definitely a difficult fight, and that's why it needs just everybody together. There, there was good inroads made a couple of years back before the pandemic. 
um, getting to the, the top tables with the council and, and all that type mm -hmm. of things. There was a lot of good stuff done at that point in time. Um, but kind of with the pandemic, it's all fell by the wayside. Yeah. It's picked up again. There's a there's a new parades document here now through Glasgow City Council, which uh -huh. is still tried and tested as well with a new document that's been, been kind of brought out there. So that uh -huh. remains to be seen what happens with that. We're just, again, we're just back at this, the start of the marching season, if you uh -huh. like coming up again to see what you know what spanners that throws in the works here for sure. us so it's been difficult and it's it's, it's a difficult fight out here and yeah. people are actually being people are more withdrawn now in my view and to, because they're scared to kind of stand up and put their head above the parapet you know I yeah no yeah i think you're right there's there's elements of that here as well pat you know because obviously i don't know why do you use of the same system as us obviously we've got 11 bar one forms that we have to to complete for parades. I don't know why you do use of a similar kind of setup there or not. But one person always has to have their name on that is taking responsibility for a parade and stuff, you know. And it's like, do I want to do this? Because I remember organizing a parade for um a CD launch as part of a CD launch. You know, there was a parade not there and then I I'd submit at the eleven bar one. And it's like and when I was talking to the police like oh you do realize we putting your name on this anything happens at this parade and it's you we're coming to. Yeah, and we kind of go right. Well, that puts a different slant on it, doesn't it? <laughs> the same here. So somebody's uh -huh. name on that notice. It was a parade notification. Uh -huh. uh, it can still be called that after it was all challenged in court and different things the other year. Whether it's more of an application now was one right. of the efforts that's kind of open um, for debate. But I suppose somebody's name still got to go in that form as a parade organizer. Um, yeah. Well, who are responsible? For that, but as I say, there's quite a few grey areas within the new kind of parades code of conduct, if you like. I think they call uh -huh. it. So obviously, there was a wee bit of trouble related to other parades and things over here as well. So sure. it, remains, it, remains, it remains to be seen what actually happens now. Um, with yeah. this well, but there's a few grey areas in there that are, are pretty easy to target. To be perfectly honest, we need. Uh -huh. But I think there's something there as well for bonds, like you're saying, for bonds to be coming together and potentially doing some regulation and stuff themselves and maybe kind of preempting, you know, you know, the fact that there can be legislation that may be brought in to govern how parades operate. And I think that, that that's where I'm doing some work here at the moment with some bonds around trying to develop some kind of program or charter as such that allows bonds to regulate their parades themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, or and preempting some of the potential issues that are being brought against them, and for them to approach authorities to say, "Here's what we're putting in place to make sure that our parades are one safe for everybody to be involved in, and in terms of those who are taking part in terms of marching, but also how we make them safer and you know more enjoyable for the people who are watching. What do we need to do in order to do that?" Yeah. How do we need to work with you in order to make sure that you know you'll have certain things that you'll want to get out of it, and I, and also doing something around an education piece around with placing here in terms of listen, there's a reason why you don't walk through the ranks of a bond, you know, there's a traditional element in regards to you know what is this about, and you know, foster that education aspect, and I'm I'm really excited about the potential that that may have for fostering better relationships. And um, it's something that I know that the bonds forums over here are doing a lot of. I know the London Dairy Bonds Forum has been, you know, very active in that area in regards to, you know, working towards better relationships, better education, better understanding, and, and and trying to be proactive rather than reactive in terms of things, you know. And I think that that's that's it's a key for the future of the scene. I think that's right, and I, th I think being <laughs> being reactive is the issue for us mm. because it's always reactive. Everything over here is reactive, and it is trying to get that, get in the front foot, you know. And there was lots of good discussions at the the top table, if you like, with the council. Yeah. Um, years back, we're, we're regarding all these things and being able to put your points, you know, across and stuff. So uh -huh. they've, they've developed this new code of conduct to it, which is actually introduced something similar. So look, there's a risk assessment, if you like, for that yeah. trade, uh, and notification of certain things on the route and different stuff like that. So hopefully that brings more integration between the organizers sure. parades and the authorities or whoever that might be but that just mm -hmm. depends on the officer in charge on the day because the officer in charge on the day will just decide what happens and when yeah. you get a parade here we have 20 police officers running about you know so I again know. it's different from where you are obviously in, in northern ireland it's 
the police presence here on the parades, and especially the big parades, is just unbelievable now. Mm. And it's not unnecessary for what it is. It's over policed. I know. Again, I, it is. Another thing they can use against you for the cost of the actual parade. I know. It's that's it. And it's instigated that way. And I know we would say we didn't want to hit there. There's political stuff or whatever. But I mean, this is these are the key elements to trying to keep things positive for the bonds and keeping our relationship with people in the community positive as well. Yeah. You know, but sometimes you watch videos from the parades in Scotland. There's more policemen than bonds, man. You know, it's you know, I I I don't know how you 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 handle that there because I know it it, it it's. It would be crazy over here to think that there was twenty policemen surrounding a band here. Even yourself, the bands, the bands police themselves. You know, we've we an experienced band, the same as you know the Raven and lots of other bands, and you police yourself yeah. when you're in that street and in that kind of environment. Uh, you don't need another ten police, twelve police from about the band because it's just drawing attention to the band. Yeah, exactly. That's it. That's exactly what it's doing. Now, I'll give you an example that a remembrance parade last year. We walked in Springburn. We were going to the local church. Um, uh -huh. But there was a wee, there's a VRC church up a side street, which uh -huh. they pointed out before the parade. And then when the parade, the police started shouting and bawling, you know, stop, 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 stop. So I just get the band Mark Time finished, we're tuned, moved on. And then I approached them after it. And I says, you caused that. You caused that, you know, and you just, you basically just drew attention to the band for no reason whatsoever. Because uh -huh. that, that if it's a place of worship, it wasn't pointed out before the parade. That's because I approached them and asked them, where does the place of worship? You want us to stop it? You want us to stop playing? Um, and the thing about it is, you can buy that. There wasn't a service only you're playing a hymn, you're playing a sacred hymn, you know, and they're still yeah. there, they're screaming and shouting and bawling in the street. But they're the ones that's drawn attention to that. Uh -huh. They've also drawn, you know, bad attention to the band for everybody looking yeah. at them. The passers by, people that are there supporting the parade, are part of the parade, kind of know what's going on. Um, but it's more the ones that the passers by, you know, looking at it going, oh, there they're at it again, you know, when it's. I know. And I, and I think that's, that's sad that that's the case, you know, and especially even if you are playing. You know, a, a hymn or something going past a place of worship, and I, I, I think that that's, you know, I, I, for me, uh, it's obviously easy for me to sit here and say I don't have a problem with that. And generally, would like to think if it's a place of worship and it's a hymn that that's not going to cause too much of an issue of con of concern. And I think that that's where maybe some of the the relationship aspect, you know, and what people aren't aware of. You know, because I mean, if you, it's it's great. This is one of the things that I, I love about over here is it said only hymns from this point. And I think, well, how do you know this isn't the, how do you know this is a hymn? Yeah. You know, do, do we, are we getting to the point where you're going to have to sit? Do you, do you guys know what hymns are? Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, so if you're standing here video on us, you know, walking past a particular area and it's, there's a big massive saying that says only religious tunes or only religious then from this point on. Yeah. How do you how, how do you know what what's religious and what's not, or what's potentially non contentious? You know what I mean? Because for me, I would have no problem walking past a church of any kind playing a military march. Yeah. Because for me, there's no sentiment attached behind that, apart from the fact there may be some event that's being commemorated, but there's no lyrics attached to it as a tune. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or if you walk past. Anything, I mean, if you walk, uh, walk past the chapel and you're playing a bed with me or you're playing What a Friend We Have in Jesus or what any of those type of hymns, I would be wanting the people who are placing the parade to be aware that's what these tunes actually are. And if you're worried about what the, what's being played, you need to know what the, this, the tune actually is as well. You know, there's especially when there's no service room, it's just an empty building. Yeah, exactly. That, that, Debates are here in one of the big disputes with the, the council and the police and things like that. If, if uh -huh. there's a zone, fair enough, abide by whatever they're asking. But if there's no, then what is the issue with playing just a sacred hymn walking past yeah. the church parade? We're actually going to church and we're uh -huh. playing for the biggest majority of that route, um, you know, actually to get to the church. So I don't uh -huh. see it. it's one of the big contentious points over here as well. But I think you're right in just backtracking a wee bit in terms of the bands here that. The bands in in Scotland or in Glasgow in particular, which I know, I think they I think they work a lot closer now um, than what they've done in the past because it, it is one it's one fight if you like for everybody we're all mm -hmm. in it. Uh, and I think that social media has helped that. So I know boys from all over the city and we all mm -hmm. know guys each and you know but we're, we're own bands and stuff. So that's the social media things really helped in that in the last kind of 10, 12 years bringing bandsmen closer if you like. Yeah, uh, we're really all integrated a lot more. So that. That's a massive positive um, yeah. you know, on the band scene. And, and then new bands starting up like Stevie's band in Drum Chapel, you know, they yeah. reinvented the wheel again. So that's positive. Yeah. Because 
when they came to us a few years ago, the guys were first class, but I says, you know, if, if it didn't work the last time, what makes you think it's not going, it's going to work this time? But they've uh-huh. been the wheel. They've, they've kind of developed a new style of band, which yeah. wasn't available in Glasgow. So yeah. along the lines of, you know, the, the Nether and the County and the White Rock, but that yeah. was in Glasgow anywhere. Um, and fair play to them, they're going, you know, they're going really strong, and I hope it. Yeah. You know, it's no. keep Definitely, I think that that's there's a, a key element that, but it's all about relationships. I think you know, and that's the next step that you know for a lot of bonds will be. It's about how do, and it, it's and they're hard, no hard things to do. But what is our relationship with the place like? How do we? Yeah. Is there a possibility of us making that better? And I know, and I know that that's controversial for some people. Some people are not entertaining. But for me, I think if you're looking at the, the greater health of the of the yeah. scene. Somewhere along the line, it may be something we have to address, you know. And I know for me, it's definitely something that I'm looking at in regards to well, how do we make that better? Because it can't stay the way it is. It's not that we don't have maybe have the same issues that that, that you that, that you guys are having in regards to the place of creates, but there are incidents, you know, of, that could be dealt with better in terms of you know the the observation of a parade, how that's handled, and you know even you know. The people have been, you know, approached that they have to go to court because they were seen playing going on video going past a particular place that they weren't supposed to be playing and stuff, you know. And we're, we're, you know, we're we're, we're dishing out sent, like community sentences and fines for people, you know, because they've they've, they've done this, you know. And I think there's another way of dealing with that, but that comes through relationship, you know, rather than that's just you know raise a protest about it, you know. There, there's if we want things to change. We have to engage with the methods that allow things to change in some shape or form. I think you need to keep focusing and concentrating on the bigger picture. Yeah, as you say, it's about the health of the age and the health of our culture moving yeah. forward. Um, and there's only one to do that, and it's it's to one way of doing it is to keep dialogue. Um, yeah, with the powers that be and, and keep having these these kind of open discussions with them. But again, yeah. that comes with a stronger voice collectively. Again, yeah, it takes you back to that same thing again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think mean, maybe that's maybe one of the key things coming out of this. Yeah, there's no point in approaching things as different entities. If you like, it needs to be coming as part of a, you know a, a kind of bigger organisation. Um, yeah, definitely. So, see the document you were talking about in regards to this, the, the regards to parades. Is that something that's available online or whatever else? Can you get a hold of that? Get it online now. Yeah, if you're going to make a, an application or a notification for a parade, um, then you need to have a look at the the code of conduct. So it's right. Dangerous. Council Code of Conduct for Parades and Processions. You'll be able to get that and, and download it. Uh, right. Because that's just been broken. I think they were, it was it was being redrafted. It was something that was drafted probably four or five years ago, maybe. And it's uh-huh. been drafted now over the last kind of year and a half to two years. Um, and it should be, I, th- I think it's coming into force this year, as far as I right, understand. Okay. Um, so and we're bonds should... involved in that, Pat? Were bonds consulted in regards to that? The bonds are involved. The band association was asked for input into it, I believe. Right. Um, I'm, not, I'm not involved in the band association, so I'm not sure what that was, but there was obviously the, the Orange, I believe, the Apprentice Boys, the Blacks, the band association were all asked for their input into that, as well as the, some of the other like, kind of groups, if you like. Uh-huh. And SPAD being one of them, so I think that was asked for in terms of the, right. the input into that. And the whole thing's been developed off of that. How much of that's actually been taken into account would probably remain to be seen, but when mm-hmm. I the last time I looked at it, there's just loads of like any of these things. There's loads of grey areas in it, um, and loads of areas that can just be you know like, kind of twisted and and turned to suit anybody. Um, right. To do that, so but it'd be into have a read at it, see what you think. But it should. Yeah, no, I definitely will. I mean, I'll, it's it's always good to keep abreast of what all the developments are, you know, in regards to maybe working with people and stuff as well, you know, in terms of coming up with stuff. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. In terms of maybe trying, maybe finishing off here, Pat, um, there's a couple of things I wanted to ask you. Any yep. plans for the side to record CD again or do new music? Oh, the, the, we did have a couple of plans. We've kind of pushed it back a wee bit. Now. Right. Um, but we were planning maybe doing something before the pandemic hit. Uh-huh. You know, we were planning something towards the start of this year, but kind of time's just caught up on us. So right. maybe at the end of the year again, uh, we're planning and maybe trying to do something. Because that was always a, one of our plans for the anniversary. Uh-huh. To record that maybe last year or the year before, so we had it ready to go out. So, again, sure. with the pandemic, things time's caught up on us. So, hopefully, towards the end of the year, uh, there may be plans afoot for, for doing something again. Yeah, brilliant. And here for the 12th again, are you? We are hopefully we're booked up, <laughs> right? 
we're still just waiting to confirm exactly where we're going to be parading. Um, but we booked up with flights booked two years back, and I've just managed to move the flights on. Uh -huh. uh, this year, obviously, again, due to the pandemic. So um, we're still just trying to finalise. We've got three or four different offers in, and we're just trying to right. finalise. The next two weeks, we'll finalise where we're going. A lot of the young boys want to go to Belfast, and then there's a couple of country parades on offer them again. But I must say, we've we done East Belfast, what would be 2019 now, I think, before the right. pandemic. Uh -huh. And it was the first time I've done East Belfast, and it was absolutely fantastic. And I know it's your kind of neck of the woods as well, but yeah, it was, and it's the best I've ever felt after the 12th of July parade. Yeah, um, I tell you what, you want to been here for this year's or last year's? Uh -huh. Last year's was amazing. So it was I have to say, see, see, and I know this is it's kind of I I say this all the time, and I've been giving people have been giving me jib from saying the same things over and over again. Last year with the 12th at home. Yeah. And we prayed around East Belfast, and the prayer was finished by about half four in the afternoon. Yeah. And it was an amazing day, amazing weather, great crowds. I have to say, there was something great about knowing that once you finished at half past four, that that return leg from Shaw's Bridge wasn't yeah. actually waiting on you, and you weren't going to be finishing until half nine, ten o'clock at night. Yeah. I had, there was, it was brilliant being able to actually feel like you could enjoy the 12th after you'd finished. It was, it was fantastic. Now, we're not going to get away with that this year. They're not going to do it. They're going to obviously go back to the That's traditional route. But I, I'm not looking I'm not looking forward to the 12 miles. So, you know, you, yeah. make sure these guys in your in your bond see the podcast and like, listen, you are going to do a full 12 mile again. It's not this wee half, wee mm -hmm. half hearted parade, like, you know. <laughs> I think after Glasgow, we are, as I say, the, the parade back for here, our big walk, I was, I was yeah. exhausted last year. Yeah. Uh, we hadn't been parading for two years and and for us most of the way home it's kind of uphill yeah. uh, well and we, the, the roads are all closed off and it's site hill so we need to go a long way around the town and then back yeah, up. Yeah. that was probably worse for me in a long time uh, yeah. I kind of struggling last year but I might say East Belfast was, was just first class and but the other boys loved it we were and it's the best I've ever felt as I say after the 12th of July uh -huh. um, so I don't know where we'll end up this year we'll definitely be there somewhere um, uh -huh. either Belfast or one of the, the country parades, but over the next kind of two weeks we'll finalise that where we're going. Yeah. And what about the centenary parade? Is is I take it are you over for that or are you coming I on your own basis? I think we're just coming on our own. I think we're all just coming out to watch it. Most of the boys will probably right. come over and watch it. So because there's there's quite a lot that's in May, isn't it? Yeah, May twenty eighth or so, yeah. We've not really got a lot on in May, but come June we're out for I think six weeks in a row or something for June right uh -huh. and, and through then. So and again, it gets harder with boys. We shift patterns at work and different things, and uh -huh. um, you've got to be kind of cool with all that stuff as well. So, no, I think we're all just coming for a jolly for that one. Right, okay. Just, yeah, well. <laughs> well, Big Chef, you see us knocking about, give us a shout, man, anyway, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, okay. um, because I was on a mission to try and get you, I don't know why you've seen the podcast, but I was on a mission to try and get the county, the Netherton, yeah. Drum Chapel, and mm -hmm. the one, the White Rock either trying to either be, as a mass bond yeah or as try and get them one after the other but i'm kind of it's 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 been blown out of the water because the nether aren't coming for it so oh, they as far as, you know, so no the, i think the county are definitely coming obviously the weight rock will be there and i'm near sure stevie said drum chapel were we're coming over for it i think as well but um I, that's a dream of mine anyway is to have those four bonds walking together one big moss bond somewhere and i thought you know here wouldn't it wouldn't the centenary parade be an absolute amazing time for that to happen you know what i mean but uh well we could we could wait for it anyway wait for it it'll happen sometime absolutely you know so maybe Boston, just in rock i walked with them when i was a, a juvenile probably in belfast i think uh -huh. was about 10 years of age or something and it was a white rock that was a band then, so I always had a wee bit of a soft spot for the guys. But I love that the, 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 the four bands are great, you know, today. Fantastic, I know. No, I, I, that, that for me, it's just, it's just, it's just good, it's just good entertainment, you know. It, you know, there's no, it's not fancy, it's not a, it's just, it's just good, solid, you yeah. know, playing and everything. And I, and I think that that's great. But maybe one of the things in terms of maybe closing this one off is if, if there was one thing that you could share with someone to help them understand. The bond seemed better. What would that be? Something to share with somebody. Probably just the the kind of camaraderie in the bands and what we do for the youths, um, and then yeah. the areas and try and take the kids off the street and give them something, yeah, because it's an education at the end of the day. Yeah, if you're kind of that up, 
um, and a lot of the unsung work that goes on behind the scenes as well for the local community, um, just to try and keep promoting that as much as we possibly can. Um, but get yourself involved in a band, you know, it'll stand you in good stead, the, the, the friendship, the, the, the you know, the, the, just the, the harmony that, the, that you'll get within the band scene um, will be second to none, absolutely. And go and support your local band, definitely. Brilliant. Well, listen, Pat, I just want to say thanks very much for coming on the podcast. Absolutely delighted that you've been able to take the time out and share a wee bit of your own story, share a wee bit about, you know, some of the history of the band and how it's developed, and then obviously get into a wee stuff around some of the issues that are facing the band scene for as, as a whole, man. So thank you very much. It's been fantastic. The time's flowing in here. Yeah, no bother. Thanks very much, Glenn.